Welcome, welcome, welcome to another OU Insider Under the Visor Sooners podcast. Podcast. My name is Brandon Drum. I'm here with Parker Thune and spring, spring game. All of it is upon us, even though it's going to be chilly and rainy on Saturday. We'll see if the game even happens Saturday and they don't move it to the following weekend, which would just screw OU as far as some visits go, but that's the nature of the beast. Um, did you see that, Parker? That they were talking about potentially moving it just because of the... I was the under weather? the impression. I was under the impression that if they moved it, it was going to be a Friday. It, that would be smart to have everybody, because everybody would already be in town that evening. You kick off about 7 o'clock. That would be your best bet, because it would be about 65 degrees, perfectly done. But... My, I guess the biggest question would be, and you tell me, would that affect attendance in a positive or negative light? I kind of think it'd be positive. Uh, I think, I don't know. It's hard to say because it really is just like, you know, it's, it happens once a year. It's kind of a shot in the dark. You don't really have trends to go off. I kind of think if the game were to get moved, attendance would be negatively affected just because people have been planning for April 20th for so long. All right. of a sudden, they have to change their plans. So I tend to think the crowd would get a little smaller. Probably not much smaller, but a little bit smaller. If it kind of was- sucks that they didn't they didn't really do the push. Like, they're going to the SEC, and I almost, I think you and I discussed this one time, figured, you know, going to the SEC, they were going to try to push the pack the house narrative again and try to get 75,000 people in there to show that they're, quote, SEC ready. And that just wasn't, it just didn't happen. Like you didn't see a big, there was no big social media push. There was no big press push, right? To pack the house, to show your SEC ready. None of that stuff. It was just a normal old spring, even though there's nothing normal about it. You know what I mean? Like, and I know they can't have the SEC logo on the, on the field because they're still, I guess, by virtue, by virtues in the Big Twelve at this juncture until what July first, right or June first or something to that extent. But by all intents and purposes, they're SEC, and so you want to show that you're SEC ready across the board, and that even goes with spring, right? So that's just my opinion. And how's this for a segue, folks? If you want to get your balls SEC ready, you need to get in touch with the folks at Manscaped. Go to manscaped.com, check out the lawnmower family, including the lawnmower 3.0 plus, the 4.0, and the 5.0 ultra. Call them what you want, knee knockers, golden nuggets, thigh slappers, etc. But our friends at Manscaped refer to them as the boys. Not every man has children, but every man is responsible for their two boys below the waist. When your little guys have more hair than they need, trust Manscaped for all your grooming dreams. Boys need love too, so join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by going to manscaped.com. Now, boys need love too, and for this reason, each of Manscaped's three trimmers in the lawnmower family is equipped with skin-safe technology, an LED spotlight, and unique features for different grooming needs. The skin-safe uh, technology does not guarantee cut protection, but I don't know what comes next. I'm reading the ad copy right now, and I think there's supposed to be a second half of that sentence, and I guess there's not. So just know, folks, that the skin safe technology does not necessarily guarantee cut protect- protection. I guess that's a disclaimer. Uh, they're waterproof too. Need I say more? So with the basic, if you want the basic trim, go for the 3.0 and work your way up to the 4.0 and 5.0 for the ultimate grooming experience. This right here is on the cutting edge. Upgrade your ball trimmer and your life will follow. Get 20% off and free shipping with Cody Insider at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code insider at manscaped.com for the best your boys have ever looked. Trust Manscaped. Boy, that was a roller coaster, but boys got the, need love too. We got the bills paid. 
Uh, we got a lot of ground to cover over the course of this podcast. We will talk spring ball. Uh, we will talk spring game, obviously. Uh, we will talk transfer portal, some of the visitors that are on tap this weekend. We'll work around to basketball, and uh, boy, what a five-alarm fire mm-hmm. that is right now. Mm-hmm. But we will we will address that in good time. Uh, Brandon, big weekend shaping up for the Sooners, not just in terms of the product that we're going to see on the field mm-hmm. at Gaylord Family Oklahoma Memorial Stadium, but also with three big time transfer visitors that the Sooners are going to be hosting this weekend. Yeah, I guess we start with Philip Bilby. Bleedy. Um, Bleedy. I always call him Bilby. Bleedy. Philip Bleedy. Um, I've actually known that kid for a long time. Uh, our man, Jason Swanee, used to be our photographer uh, back when the infancy of Parker and I's days and Colin Kennedy of the uh, – now over at uh, Sooners Illustrated, I think, or something like that. Yeah, um, I never worked yeah. with Jason Swan, so. Uh, oh, you were, so he was that, before your time. That, okay, that must me have preceded me. Yeah, so he he was our and he he went to his church. He's from his town and got to know him. Oklahoma was looking at Bleedy out of high school. He eventually went to Texas Tech. Oklahoma never really pushed, ultimately, to get him. Um, Ends up transferring to Indiana. And I know that Oklahoma, I I expect them to take two DTs in the portal. That's kind of my guess right now. Because if you take Bleedy, you're going to want to take one more that they're, they're potentially looking at. Which um, could be, which could very well be the other visitor on the defensive line this weekend, former Louisville and Arizona State defensive lineman Jermaine. Correct. Lowell. Those and, are the two names to know: Philip Bleedy, Jermaine Lowell, at least on the defensive line. And from what I know, you texted me earlier and asked if I had any transfer information, so I will dive into what I. Found out in between now and then is that Oklahoma feels like they are probably top one, two, three for Lowell right now. Um, is it top one? Is it top two or is it top three? This is important. They're nobody's gonna, they just said top three. They think they're top three. They're not I'll after take. the visit, the, after the visit, they think they're gonna have a better sense of where things stand because generally, if you can get a kid on, right particularly one that just entered the portal. And there's a part of me that feels like he entered the portal specifically to come to Oklahoma. There is a part of me that feels that way. And there's a part of me that feels the same thing with Bleedy. I know Bleedy has a couple more visits lined up, but Parker, you and I know this. With transfers, the first visit is usually where it stops. Like you don't see them taking a ton of visits normally. It's usually that one visit. And then like when Oklahoma was the last visit for a couple of transfers, like we knew at that point, Oklahoma probably wasn't getting them and they didn't. It stopped after the first visit. That first visit is always the hardest to overcome in the transfer because they're more adult about it. And they just, they, they want to go to the team that they favor the most to start, and I, I'm not going to sit here and say OU is in favor of Lowell because even sources say top one, two, or three. Like they wouldn't, they wouldn't even they they fence road, and so I'm fence riding for you guys. Basically, I'm just I'm I'm just a messenger at this point. And so, but when you read the tea leaves, that first visit is generally. Pretty telling. Uh, I know Bleedy, I think he had one right before Oklahoma, or he may have two, right? Right before yes, Oklahoma. He's Oklahoma, been to Oklahoma LSU. His last one. And he's been to LSU, and I can't remember the other school he visited. I know he canceled the Arizona visit. Yeah, that was supposed to be, it wasn't Washington one of them, potentially? It was, wa- there you go. Yeah. There you go. Washington was the other. It was, one. Washington was the 12th, LSU, or Washington, Washington was the 5th, LSU was the 12th, and Oklahoma's the 20th. Here's the thing. He's also going to visit Auburn, by the way. We'll see. Um, that's the thing. 
is he is looking for a place that's going to develop him into the NFL D tackle that he wants to be. Plus, Oklahoma has the location. He's originally from New Mexico. It's like a six hour, six and a half hour drive in comparison to it's more like 10 to LSU for his family. And Auburn's going to be more like 12, maybe 13, 14. So, like, there's that. Then you look at, you compare the D-line coaches at the respective schools that he's visiting. One is not like the other. And that one is Todd Bates. He has a resume that is, and he's about to add to the resume, considering that, you know, he coached a few of the Clemson guys for two or three years that are going to be first round picks first second round picks. So, you know what I mean? Like there's just, there's just this one is not like the other Parker, as far as development, as far as production, as far as putting guys in the NFL and Blitty has straight up told me, he's told other people, I want to go somewhere where I'm going to be taken care of on and off the field right now. And I'm going to get developed. And he it's not necessarily NIL, NIL, NIL with him. It's a portion of NIL, which is always going to be a part of every recruitment and transfer at this juncture oh, big time. from here on out. But it's not the end all. Like the end all is can you get him ready for the draft? And Todd Bates can resoundingly say, yes, I can. Now he hasn't had. Speaking of Bates, he hasn't had the talent so far since he's been on campus. He's been dealing with leftover talent and talent that they had to rush to bring in in 2022, right? But from this point on, Jaden Jackson, David Stone, Grayson Halton, uh, Dejon Terry, I just named four guys that will get drafted at some point when it's all said and done right there. You think so those guys getting drafted? I I think eventually. I, I think this after this season. You don't think so? I think, and I'm not saying like he's an early round guy. Just you know, fifth or seventh. Okay, potentially, maybe. I mean, he has that. He has that potential. Like we as reporters and uh, the OU fans look at him as a good piece. Sure. On the D line. Sure. So better than what they've had. Oh yeah. So no at, at, yeah. So. I just um, think you kind of you got to be a little different as a defensive lineman. To you get do, like, but he's a nose tackle. Yeah, so. he, he is, and you know he's. I I guess the difference between him and a guy like Jalen Redmond, right, is that Jalen Redmond was two eighty five and Dejon Terry's three fifteen. So yeah, and they, yeah, and he played inside and out. Redmond was a hybrid, and and let's let's keep it real. Redmond Redmond should have stayed. He stays. And takes the money that Oklahoma offered, which was substantial. Yes, it was. Substantial. Guaranteed substantial money. Jalen Redman is getting drafted right now. Yep. And will make a team because he was at, he almost made the team to begin with undrafted. But the problem is, is he was undrafted, therefore he was more, it was easier to cut. Like notoriously, they're going to put more. The more that they invest into the players, the higher they see them, the chances you're going to make the team. So that's just part of that's part of the gig, and that was a bad decision. By and, and let me tell you this, not to beat a dead horse here, Parker, but the people that represented Jalen Redmond at the end of his career at the University of Oklahoma sucked, and I'll flat out say it. The people that represented him all the way up to that point, and you know, I know that person really well, had his best interests at heart. I'll say it now, because it's 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 over with. He's gone, but he listened to some bad bad advice when he got rid of the people that were telling him the right thing to do. So, um, but with Blitty, I. You can't look at the stats, Parker. Like, 
No, and is, you shouldn't. You should not look at the stats with any defensive tackle because. But then Lowell has really good stats. <laughs> Lowell has pretty good stats. Uh, pretty good. I mean, again, what are what are like, standards yeah. for interior defensive? Well, I mean, he had he had seventeen tackles and one and a half sacks last year. Lowell did right, so, but in his career, what do you have? What was it like six sacks or something like that? Was that not what I read? Six and a half. Was that not what I read? I know he was injured for the majority of the 2022 season. So he was just kind of shaken back this last year with Louisville and had a moderately productive season. Um, Mm -hmm. So I, I think both of these guys, Bleedy and Lowell, you know, are they, are they the type that in and of themselves are going to drastically move the needle for the Oklahoma defense. No, but how many of those guys at that position are you going to find in the portal? You just need depth at this juncture. Correct. How many of those guys, like how many war daddies are you going to find in the portal that don't already have their mind made up when they hit the portal as to which school they're going to go to for an enormous bag, i.e. Bear Alexander last year being a great Mm -hmm. example. So, Bleedy and Lowell, you know, two guys with a proven track record of production. They've done it at the P4 level. Uh, They're not going to break the bank, and they're going to come in and provide quality depth in an immediate sense and take the pressure off. And, you know, I'm not sure either of these guys necessarily feel a great deal of pressure on their shoulders, but to take the pressure off David Stone and or Jaden Jackson to be a day one starter at Oklahoma. I think there's Mm -hmm. a lot less of an expectation in that regard. If you have bleedy and or Lowell on the roster. So those are two crucial visitors this weekend for Oklahoma. The third is SMU transfer center, Branson Hickman. And I know I, I was talking to one particular source tonight that knows that uh, family and that process quite well. And that individual indicated that this could be it for Branson Hickman. This could be the one that causes him to shut it down. He's been in the transfer portal since January. He's a grad transfer. So he's kind of had time to navigate the process at his own pace, figure out uh, what's best for him and, you know, what's going to uh, be the best direction as it were for the final year. Where all has he visited kind of, Walk walk people through that. I don't know. Yeah, and I'm trying to figure that out. I'm trying so to the second the he's... second the fans hear that they're gonna be like, oh great, we're just taking. You know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm trying to figure out where he has visited and if he has any plans to for visits subsequent to the OU spring game. But what I know for the moment, again, from a source that I would consider to be pretty authoritative uh, in this particular process, is that this. This could be it for Branson Hickman. Like there's a very good chance he winds up at Oklahoma, which would be huge for the Sooners because you lose Troy Everett. You got to kind of count on a redshirt freshman in Josh Bates. And I think Josh Bates is a good player. I think he's got a bright future, but again, that's a lot to put on a kid's shoulders as a redshirt freshman when he wasn't necessarily expected to be the guy at that position when Campbell, but Branson Hickman has 33 career starts to his name. So I want to talk about experience and track record at the center position, which can be a difficult thing to find in the portal. Hickman's got it. This would be massive for Oklahoma if they were able to lock him down. Go back and watch. Go back and watch him versus the Oklahoma defensive line. I remember Stone had like a – he balled out because he had all the time in the world against Oklahoma. I mean, he may – but granted – you know, he made some crazy throws that he did not make the rest of the year. But SMU, I think they won 10 games, correct? They did. We're right there on the cusp of a New Year's Six Bowl berth. Yeah. It was between them and Liberty for that G5 auto qualifier. So the, the, the my point is, is that he can play at the level. Like, you're talking about a guy that's experienced, can play at – the SEC level, had he stated SMU, he's going to be playing against Florida State, Clemson, and Miami and the like of those teams anyways. So, I mean, it's not too far off. I mean, SEC is different, but the three teams I just named have SEC talent, and you're going to play those teams. It's not going to be easy. Louisville, 
prior to last week when they just lost everybody in the portal, which was just like, what just happened? <laughs> Did you see that tweet? Yes. I it was like seven dudes. They were like, and they're like all starters. They're all entering the portal. So whatever's going on at Louisville is no bueno. Um, if you're a Louisville Cardinal fan. So it just, to me, if you can land Hickman at center, I think that's huge. I spoke to a source last night that said, look, the offensive line is going to be just fine. They need a center. They need a center. If they can find a center, all is well. Because you're going to have Sexton at left tackle. Your left guard's going to be Garen Hatchett. You could have Hickman at center. Your right guard's going to be Fabici Weiwu. And your right tackle is going to be Jake Taylor slash Spencer Brown, which it's going to be Jake Taylor at this juncture. So, and you have Tarquin as kind of a rotation guy. And you're adding Eddie Pierre-Louis in June, who is a freak athlete. You're going to get Akinkumi back from his injuries. Um, and I know people are like, but what about Troy Everett? I don't hold your breath for him being back by September. No, and, you know, we've talked about that. Or August 30th. Guess. Yeah. Yeah. Having him back prior to the beginning of the season is a wildly optimistic timeline. Yeah. 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 So all that said, uh, I don't other, expect other, Hickman to be the last guy they take in the portal on the offensive line though, either. I think that I think they're going and you see it right now. Shane Witter, as we're doing this announced, he's going in the portal. So there's one piece off the board with scholarships. Obviously Shane Witter has been at Oklahoma for four years. So this is, it's somebody that was expected. Yeah, then like, look, I. But you hate to see it because he's a good kid and a hard. Oh, worker. he's an awesome kid. He's been dealt a tough hand as far as injuries mm -hmm. are concerned. I was really, really high on him because I remember that abbreviated COVID nineteen season in twenty twenty where good. he saw the field a little bit as Drew. He made plays, man. He made plays. He he seemed like a guy that was poised to make a quantum leap. Ended up in Alex Grinch's doghouse in twenty twenty one. I honestly don't know if that has more to do with Shane Witter or more to do with Alex Grinch. I would figure there are two distinct sides of the story there. Mm -hmm. uh, but then he has that shoulder injury early in the 2022 campaign. And just like that, that made things difficult for him because at that point he had to work his way back up the depth chart. And there were a lot of guys that kind of benefited from uh, the time in which he was sidelined to really make a statement in terms of, making the coaching staff feel like they belonged in the rotation. So I, I I tell you when I saw the spring roster and I saw that the Sooners had taken Jersey number 13 away from Shane Witter and given it to a true freshman and Reggie powers, that's kind of where I figured, Oh, well, that's, that might be a portal casualty right there. That's mm -hmm. not the greatest beacon as far as Shane Witter's future at the university of Oklahoma, but best of luck to him. He was a guy that the Sooners flipped late in the process in the 2020 cycle from Wake Forest. And most anyone that has been on campus over the last four years for any amount of time will tell you Shane Witter is one of the fastest players yeah. on Oklahoma's entire team and has been. So uh, he brings speed, he can hit, and you know, assuming he can recapture pre-injury form, he's got two years of eligibility left, he can parlay that into a decent role somewhere. Oh, I agree. I think going back to Wake Forest is, excuse me, is an option that is probably on the table. Um, he was a top one hundred and fifty player in the country. Winter was, I mean? yeah, twenty four seven had him ranked high. Go look at his twenty four seven. I believe he is top one hundred and fifty, top two hundred for sure. Will do. Um, he was indeed but, number one hundred and seventy nine overall. Yeah. Two, two, 200, I guess. Yeah. But so he, he moved up quite a bit. I know that, you know, I, I remember talking when we were at the old mothership um, to Steve Wolfong, and he was super high on Witter. Uh, everybody was. So was Brian Doan. Like they loved Witter. So, um, 
that was a, a, considered a really big coup for Oklahoma at the time and Brian Odom. So I, again, like you said, injuries sucks because great family, great kid, wish nothing but the best for him. But that's puts Oklahoma, what, three now over, I believe, on scholarships, maybe a little more. Uh, and you're going to start seeing more scholarship names pop up over the next week or two. And I wouldn't freak out too much about it. Um, there's there's a chance there's some casualties that are a surprise. Yeah. Even less. Again, like I, I feel like we've said it enough, but I want to reemphasize it because there will be people listening for the first time. I fully expect that there will be at least a player or two that hits the transfer portal from the Oklahoma roster. And as a fan, you're sitting there going, oh, like that guy had some potential. That kind of stings. But again, if you go down the roster right now, it's really difficult to find guys that you know for sure are never going to make a meaningful contribution at Oklahoma. In years past, it has not been difficult to find those guys on the roster. Yep. And that, sp- that speaks to roster reconstruction, everything that Coach mm-hmm. Venables and his staff have accomplished over the last two and a half years. But even so, like the portal losses this spring are probably going to sting a little bit more than the portal casualties of the winter window or the windows of previous years, whether winter or spring. This is just the reality. There's a culling of the fold that has to happen if you want to get it down to 85 scholarships. Yep. And the Sooners, as we mentioned, are in the market for at least one offensive lineman and at least two defensive linemen. So you got to cut scholarships somewhere. And you're going to have to have some hard conversations with guys. And there will be guys that, to use a brutal but accurate term, get cut, get kicked to the curb. So when I say that there's potential for two offensive linemen, I think we've been hearing buzz on another one for a while. Though I will say that buzz has died down some, which I found interesting. Um, there are some that think that that's not going to take place now. We'll see. Um, do you think there's a world that if the person that we've been hearing for a while at defensive tackle actually hops in the portal, I'm not counting he, on it. I'm not, I'm not either. Him. I'm not, do counting you on like him take three? The portal, and if he gets in the portal, I'm not counting on him coming to Oklahoma. Not now, but like if they, let's say Oklahoma decides to play ball, do you could do they take three with what they have? Because what I was told this weekend and just yesterday, straight up was, man, the way that this young core of defensive tackles has played. The fact that they're already 300 pounds and probably going to be like, – David Stone's going to be probably rocking 305, 310, right? Jaden Jackson's like 305 right now. He was 297 a month ago when we interviewed him. They say he's like 305 now. He's probably going to get in the 315, 320 range when it's all said and done. This offseason, like that's how much he's putting on weight and how fast – Granted, both of them could plateau at some point, but both of their Probably frames, will. both of their frames still allow for much more weight, particularly David Stone. Like at 300 pounds, he still doesn't look like he weighs three. It looks like he weighs 250. So I, I my point is that every source is, that I've talked to has been like, well, you know, before spring, we thought, can't really count on the young guys so they could they're going to be good they're going to be in rotation they're going to play a lot but it's not something they felt they were going to be ready for now that you're almost all the way through spring i think they've done 13 practices at this point the 14 later on this week and then 15 with the spring game you hear something completely different parker it's yeah, we needed three. We would like to take three D tackles this spring, add some depth. Now it's like maybe you just take one, maybe you take two. 
right? Um, they like Jaden Jackson. They like the the growth of Grayson Halton, who continues to add weight. He's definitely not adding weight at the pace of David Stone and Jaden Jackson, but he's adding weight. He also has a different frame than those two guys, right? Like he's built completely different. So that also makes up, but he's he's become a leader. He's become very active. He's become very aggressive. He's been making plays all spring. So you add the fat, then you add Dejon Terry to that. And you've got four guys that you think you can go to battle with on a night in and night out basis right now, ready to roll. If you add two more and you've got six D tackles that you feel like can make plays and you're not going to have a drop off no matter what. When is the last time an Oklahoma team's had that? Everybody wants to talk about 2020 and 2021 D lines, and they were fantastic. That that was a nest. They're all in the NFL. So it was awesome. But they weren't deep. And edge and D tackle now, let's say for argument purposes, they land both of those. Visitors, transfer visitors, and uh, Bleedy and Lowell, okay? Think about that D-line depth now, Parker. Not only that, the experience on a D-tackle and an edge. When is the last time you could say that? That you've had it all the way down to the third rotation. Two thousand and ten. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, I assumed that was a rhetorical question. Or that no, you were well, going to I'm answer asking yourself. It, it's got to be 2010, <laughs> 2011, it's, right? It's certainly been longer than the time I have spent on the beat. That's for sure. I guess 2014, 2014, 2015, they were really good at D-tackle and uh, D-line. But it's been a long time. You weren't covering. And I was in my infancy ages covering the team. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's been a long time. That, that, and that was a 2015 team where they were ranked like 25th or 28th in defense that year. Yeah. That's the last time Oklahoma's even been ranked that high. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's been rough. Oh, man. Oklahoma, if Oklahoma can make a couple of key additions here in the portal, and again, I think that is as simple to me as finding another defensive tackle. One's enough. Two is ideal, but one's enough. And then bringing in a center to kind of help solidify the interior of that line. There's a lot to be excited about, man. And I think there's a lot to be excited about regardless, but that goes mm-hmm. a long way towards addressing your two biggest questions right now as a football team. Two biggest roster related questions is can you get the O line problem solved? And are you going to have enough pieces on that interior defensive line to be able to hold up in SEC play? And if you can land a dude in the portal on the defensive line and a dude in the portal at center, boy, you're feeling a lot better as a Sooner fan about where things stand going into the fall. Uh, let me ask you before we pivot here, what is the thing you are most intrigued to watch at the spring game on Saturday or I suppose whenever the spring game happens? Quarterbacks. Yeah. I think that's – and it's such an easy cop-out answer, but – we know the defense is good and I get, they're going to be really generic and they're not going to show a lot on defense and offense, but if Jackson looks comfortable, if he completes some passes against that defense, if they score against that defense, that's a win because let's call a spade a spade, man. That defense is nasty. Like they're they're even talking about it with Danny Stutzman this evening about how confident he is. Like he's like, yeah, you know the secondary. And Jackson even said it right. He said that secondary is it's cohesive now. They know Mm -hmm. there's no busted coverages, like none. He goes, you're not going to get a busted coverage on this defense. It's just not going to happen. And the defense as a whole is just so comfortable across the board, is what Stutzman said. He said, so it's now they're able to, instead of Danny 
and the other linebackers who were in year two last year, still kind of learning things. They're now able to vocalize to the younger guys and teach them so that they're more prepared come season and then to take over the reins come in 2025. So that's where Venables and the staff has been trying to get the defense to. It's finally there. Obviously, you've got to do it on the field. On paper, they look like they're just going to be dynamite. Everything we hear, they're dynamite across the board. So I I guess I want to see some flashes from the defense, but at the same time, I want to see Jackson and Michael Hawkins look comfortable back there in the pocket. I definitely want to see Hawkins just because I've heard he's just electric. Yeah, I want the fans to see him. Um, I think but, another, I think another storyline that's getting undersold, and maybe not undersold because you know he, he's no higher than fourth on the depth chart right now. But really interested to see what Brendan Zerbrug looks like in relation to Hawkins and Arnold because you know I, I've said for a while I think that's a kid that Oklahoma is going to need at some point, probably not this year. But somewhere down the line, I think Brendan Zerbrug is going to have his moment as an Oklahoma Sooner. I don't know what it's going to look like or how far in the future it is. But I'm excited about the long-term potential that that kid brings to the table. And uh, obviously, he hasn't gotten any first-team reps or many second-team reps, but uh, still a guy that was highly coveted as a recruit and Mm -hmm. that the Sooners landed over a variety of other Power 4 suitors. And so... Interested to see what that looks like because, you know, I obviously went up to Alliance, Ohio and watched him this past fall at the high school level, but high school ball and power five SEC football are two entirely different things. And Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I definitely curious to see how he stacks up against the two guys in Hawkins and Arnold that have obviously been the subject of the most buzz throughout spring ball. Let's talk about I look, we're gonna have a big list of visitors outside of just the transfer portal guys at the spring game this week, whenever that takes place. Which if they change the date, it's obviously gonna change everything. Um yeah, that, would really, that would really screw with things. Yeah. Um that said, last weekend, five star offensive lineman Michael Fasusi was in town. 2026 four-star quarterback Darion Coleman was in town. And we talked about Coleman on the last podcast quite a bit. Um, I'll make it simple for you guys. Buy all the stock in Oklahoma that you can with him. Uh, June 4th, sometime in June is he's coming back June 4th. So sometime in June is could be very, very good for Oklahoma regarding one of the top quarterbacks in the 2026 class out of the state of Florida also. Um, you know, There was another quarterback on campus this weekend, or on Friday, actually. And I talked to him. Jamarian Ficklin, Muskogee. Now, I don't think Oklahoma is going to offer him a scholarship, scholarship. But I think along the lines of Andy Bass, you know, along the lines of Freeman, along the lines of I'm trying to think who else is like that. There's other, other Ace guys. Ace Hodges. Yeah, Ace Hodges. Several guys that in other years would probably be scholarship guys. But since Oklahoma already has Kevin Sperry, They've kind of made it known that they're not going to offer another quarterback uh, loyal to him because he's loyal to them type deal. But Ficklin is a guy that he's from Muskogee. Luttrell's from Muskogee. Um, He's a super athlete. And I think when you look at Ficklin, when you see a quarterback, right? I see a quarterback because I think he's a phenomenal quarterback. He obviously took Muskogee to state last year. Uh, He's probably going to do it again this year. Like he's just that he's that guy, but he can play corner. He can play wide receiver. He can do a plethora, play safety. 
Like, there's a lot of things you can do with an athlete. He's the best. He is the best overall athlete in the state of Oklahoma, and it is not even debatable. Not even debatable. It's really not. He's a freak. Best overall athlete. When I say athlete. football athlete, I'm not talking like two sport athlete because that CJ Nixon and Jaden uh, Jaden Nickens take that easy. Yeah, well, I'm I, talking. And look, he's a good player. I I, I do think it's debatable <laughs> that he's the best overall. I guess. Athlete. I guess. I talked to people this weekend, and I guess some of these people are biased, but they. They will sit there and say he can. He's a Division One player at like four different positions, and I agree. Like he's he's that talented. He's a freak. I mean, he's a four four guy, right? You look at his body frame and everything about him, but he's just very sold on quarterback. Mm -hmm. He's twitchy. He's hard to tackle in space, and he's made some of the craziest throws I've ever seen. Straight up on us, like. You and I, I think we're at. Did you go to the Owasso camp when they did that last spring? The team camp. I can't recall. Truly, he I made. Cannot. He was getting hit and made a sidearm with two D tackles in his face as he's getting hit. Sidearm. One guy's jumping up in the air. The other guy's hitting from the side. Sidearmed it to go around the defender jumping up in the air and hit a freaking beautiful, beautiful dot right over the shoulder corner route in the end zone from about 35 yards away. It was just absurd. And you just don't see that with everybody. Obviously Sperry can make those throws. Jackson Arnold Hawkins can make those throws, but that shows you the talent that he has and why Oklahoma's like, you know what? Maybe we might might want a PWO. And they haven't gone that far to say that's what they're going to do, but he's visited multiple times. He has a UNLV offer at quarterback. He's got a bunch of other offers, like 15. Um, He's a good player. If Oklahoma can pull that off and get him to PWO, wouldn't you agree that's a huge win in state? Oh, enormous. 100%. He's a three-star. He keeps moving up the rankings. Like Everybody's kind of impressed with him. So I think we'll get to see him at the rivals camp too. Um, I'm also anxious to see everybody, everybody see, uh, Tyson Pogai and, uh, Jason Delgado, 2027 quarterbacks in the state of Oklahoma. They will both be at our rivals camp. They're going to shock some people with how talented those two are. So, um, but with Fasusi, let's get to talk to the Fasusi real quick. Okay. You and I both have kind of heard the same thing. Like it went from. Yeah, it's not happening to, oh, okay. And I, I talked to some people last night, a guy from Texas A&M that thinks that Ty Haywood is leaning A&M now, which I still don't buy. Um, Where is can, Ty Haywood this weekend? That's going to be a very interesting storyline. Where is he this weekend? He's supposed to be at Oklahoma. Yes, he is. <laughs> If he's at Oklahoma, that's that was my point to that person, by the way. (laughs) If he's not at Oklahoma, then there are then there's an issue there because at that point he hasn't visited Oklahoma in almost nine months as of right now. So it's been a long time since he was on campus. Was he not at the no, he didn't go to the junior day that he was supposed to to AM instead with his buddy that committed to AM. Yep. Yeah. So and obviously Haywood was back in college station this last weekend. He's been to AM more frequently than he's been to Oklahoma. He was last in Norman for Sooners under the stars last July. So if you can get him back on campus this weekend, especially with an official visit set for the month of June, I think all's fine and dandy for the moment. Mm-hmm. If he bails and goes elsewhere, then you got concerns, yeah. legit concerns. But uh I with Fasusi, man, I've just I've been burned one too many times. Oh, I'm with you. I, ugh. It's going to be hard to talk myself into that one as far as OU is concerned, especially because, kind of like we talked about in the last podcast, the common denominator between him and Lamont Rogers is we know in a general sense, in more than a general sense, 
what the asking price is for those guys, what the market value is, if you were, uh, if you will. And the fact that Oklahoma is going toe to toe in both of those recruitments with Texas, Texas A&M, Missouri, three schools that have demonstrated both the capacity and the willingness in recent recruiting cycles to spend a lot of money. Oh yeah. Yep. So you got it. You got a Leary here. I got a, sorry. A, a source was texting and we're about basketball here. And, uh, but which we'll get to in just a second, but oh, basketball fun. Yeah. Well, oh, you fans, if you don't want to hear just Parker and I just say unkind things about what's going on, you probably want to turn it off when we start talking about that. Um, yeah, for Susi, I, I agree with you. I just think when you got Missouri, Texas, Texas A&M involved, and I guess by proxy Oregon in all this, you just kind of sit back and say, we'll see. Even though we hear that Oklahoma is going to play major ball when it comes to the NIL regarding offensive line, much like they did with defensive line last year. And – to that point, they're going to continue on the defensive line side. And we say this every podcast, Parker. OU's NIL, they have way more money to deal with than they did previous. And so they are – just the roster alone is going to be a lot more expensive over the next few cycles, transfer and recruiting alike. And Oklahoma is going to be willing to do those type of things. I mean, we heard the same thing with Lamont Rogers after his visit, right? Like OU's going to play ball. They, they are going, I, I want to ask you this, knowing what we know, are you, are you going to be surprised if they go Oh, for Oh, for four with Fasusi, Babalilla, um, Haywood and Rogers. Are you shocked if they go for four? Cause I am. Yes, I will be surprised. And you know, like I, in years past, I think it's easy to see a world in which Oklahoma goes over four with those guys. It's harder to see that happening this time around because a, I think there's an awareness in the Oklahoma circle that this is a bumper crop, if you will, as mm -hmm. far as the top end goes for offensive linemen in the state of Texas, and especially just, you can even, you don't even have to kind of confine it to the state of Texas. You throw in Babalola locally, like within the 300, 400 mile radius, it's a banner year for offensive linemen. And so to come up empty with all of those studs would hurt in any given year, but especially because this is the year that Oklahoma is transitioning to the SEC and uh, the purse strings are opening a little further than they have in the past. I think if it comes down to it and a couple of those guys come off the board to other schools and Oklahoma's in a situation where they're legitimately staring down the barrel at going over four with those guys, they'll be willing to up the asking price and do what it right. takes to bring in at least one of those dudes because it would be pretty inexcusable. Not inexcusable. I mean, you know what the excuse would be, and it would be a valid excuse, but it it would hurt, and it would not be good optically to right. miss on Babalola, Haywood, Rogers, and Fasusi. Speaking of misses. Oh, boy. Here we go. Here we yeah, go. Here we go. Yep. This is the time you want to turn it off if you are – not into hearing bad news on the basketball program. <laughs> I'll give you a second. Five, four, three, two, one. All right. Too late. Stay on and listen. All right. Um, Parker. Oklahoma still to this day has the biggest offer to Brandon Garrison. And yet. Sounds like he is not going to the inverse vocal when all it like, like it was done. You're just snake bitten at that point. If you can't get Brandon Garrison for what we know to be a substantially higher pro like 
Oklahoma has offered substantially more money mm-hmm. than Oklahoma State to Brandon Garrison. Substantially more money. And if that's not enough to coax the kid 50 miles down the road to Norman America, I don't know what else you can do, man. I, at that point, you throw your hands up and go, well, this this just sucks. This is a lost cause. And obviously, they're not going to do Like, no one in that building is going to treat it as a lost cause. No one is going to throw in the towel and concede. But still, man, now that Kevin, Kevin Overton is off the board, having committed to Texas Tech, you have two players from within your local radius two remaining uncommitted portal players from within your local radius that are certified stars that you seemingly had in the palm of your hand in Sean Padula and Brandon Garrison. And now here we sit on the evening of April 16th and things are much less certain. And in fact, trending away from OU in both of those recruitments, not ideal. So I'm going to read this, okay. <laughs> you know, you know who this is. So I'll just leave it at that. But, yeah, I'm um, sure most people do. I doubt it. Um, this person said, it seemed like I'm going to paraphrase here. It seemed like, OU was in trouble when they didn't commit on the visit. Notoriously transfers commit on their first visit, like we talked about earlier. And when that doesn't happen and and it drags out, you know there's something wrong. Straight up. Yeah, when things kind of plateaued for a while with Overton, that was not a good sign. Unambiguously, not a good sign. And then he goes to Texas Tech and boom, it's over. And yeah, they offered they offered way more than Oklahoma, but and similarly, similarly, right now, it's been three days since Padula and Garrison were on campus. Nothing, not a peep. That doesn't bode well. And Brandon, if you have to go back to the drawing board, and you strike out with three dudes, three legit bona fide ball players that all hail from within 30 miles of your campus and you that's to go you host all of them and come up empty man you are cooked like, you gotta go like what are we, what, what, what what are we doing okay here, well, dude? Uh, uh, i'm not going that far yet no no but i am you, like if okay. you miss out on all of those guys he doesn't You expect Jalen Moore to stick around for that? You're bringing in a dude from freaking Tarleton State that averaged 10 points a game? He's 5'9". Yeah, okay. That's what you're rolling in with the SEC. I will say this. If Jalen Moore decides to bounce at the end of all this, then I don't know what there is to get excited about next year. You you got... you. If you're if you're Joe C right now, right now, and you know this is happening, it isn't too late. It's getting to be too late. It's not too late. The portal season's still going on. You go and you hire whoever. I don't care if you go and you hire. I don't know, uh, Mike Morgan. I don't care. Like <laughs> go hire Boynter, whatever, you know. Just it's just an example. Kellen Sampson or um, who else would be a good hire right now, Parker? I mean, that's available or semi. I mean, that the semi like the OU could go and just poach. I mean, BYU I just like- did it. BYU just did it. Kentucky just did it, and they're gonna be okay. Sure. You you just you, you're it's not too late, man. Move on. Bring in somebody and what will end up happening is players will see who they hired and people will get in the portal explicitly to go to Oklahoma and play for that person. 
That's how it works. Especially if it's a decent name. Now, if you go out and hire some nobody, then yeah, you've just you might as well kept Porter Moser and walked in there with the Division II roster of the SEC and grabbed your ankles. But I mean, but, but I mean, like, I just I, I hate calling for people's jobs, but it's exhausting, dude. That and everybody always wants to say, well, every program's going through people leaving the roster, but not like Oklahoma. It's a brand new roster every year. Nobody else is going through that. Brand new roster, brand new coaches almost every year because nobody's sticking around and they're leaving. That that's not a sustainable program, Parker. No, it's not. It's not and it it's hasn't not. been. And it's time again, to move on and start over. Like, like, here's my concern. And look, I, I'm not willing to call for Porter Moser's head in the off season. I think at this point, you know what? You've committed to him for a fourth season. All in all, things have not been atrocious during his tenure at Oklahoma. They were the second team out of the tournament in year one. They were the first team out of the tournament here in year three. There are plenty of other Power 5 basketball programs that have not sniffed the NCAA tournament in the last three years that would love to be having the type of success, if you can call it that, that Oklahoma has enjoyed under Porter Moser. But here's the problem is that, again, can, can you really call it success? It's largely been no. mediocrity. He's a few games above 500 over the course of his uh, span as Oklahoma's head men's basketball coach these last few years. And so to me, uh, you've committed to him for year four. You're going to let him see this thing through as far as the transition to the SEC. Whatever happens, happens, and then you can reevaluate next winter. But if you don't get Sean Padula and or Brandon Garrison, like God forbid you go 0 for 2 with those guys, where do you turn? Because <laughs> scores are hard enough to find in the portal. They're even harder to find at this point when so many guys have already decided upon where they're going to play college basketball next year. And like, it doesn't feel like you're scraping the, the bottom of the barrel, but it does feel like you're onto the second tier options on you're your priority on list. Third tier at this point. Cause remember even before Perdula got in, they were offer, they were after other guys that they missed out on. Right. And what does it say about you and your program? And my, mind you, a program that is notoriously and historically a top 20 basketball program all time. Potentially top 16, 15, 16, 17 all time. ESPN at one point had Oklahoma 12th all time. They were the highest ranked team that had never won a national title all time in college basketball history when they were ranking the all time greats. But what does it say about you as a coach and you and your program that it's fallen so far that you're offering more NIL than everybody else and they still don't want to come play for you? Nobody believes anymore. And I hope to God if they retain him and nothing happens over the next few weeks and they decide... You know, you're going all in reporter all the way through 24, your first year in the SEC, which is just such an awful look, by the way, if you're going to go in with just a crappy roster. I hope he proves me wrong. I will get on here and say, I'll eat crow. But right now, if they miss out on Garrison, and, and that's if, like there's some disclaimers yeah. there. If they miss on Garrison, if they miss on Padula, right? If that really happens, like... Come on, man. You, you've set you've set whoever comes up behind them back even further and makes the job even less appealing. Yeah, and that's a, you're you're playing with fire, bro. <laughs> man, it's hard because I I like Porter Moser, like, and I think most I do people too. like Porter Moser. Like, but, it, you would like to see Porter Moser succeed, but I also think you. You have to be squared with reality, right? And Porter Moser is a good basketball coach. 
great. I would have told player. you going into this last season, his roster is not that impressive. I certainly don't see 20 wins for that team. They go and win 20 games and they, they should have made the, the NCAA at one point. So yeah, yeah hey, props to Porter props to those guys. Injuries derailed it. Injuries Max. did derail. Like I think all in all, he actually did a hell of a job as a coach this last season. And so, but I'm there was a lot like, of turmoil that went with that though. Th- and why was. is there always turmoil on his teams? Like what causes that? Yeah. And I, like it, at a certain point, like, <laughs> you know, there, there is a common denominator and correlation doesn't necessarily equal causation, but there's a common denominator. And I'm not, I'm not hitting the panic button because I just saw, I just watched for take a roster that probably didn't have 20 wins in it at the beginning of the year to 20 wins in the doorstep of a berth in the NCAA tournament. They should have made the field. I think we can all agree on that. So if they have to go and grab guys from Dayton and Tarleton state and Lord knows where else to fill out this roster for the 24, 25 season, Okay, fine. Like, I'll ride with it. Let's see where this goes. But again, objectively, I don't think you can be overly confident in the outlook if that's what you're cobbling together for a roster. We, it's bad. I'm sorry. It's bad right now. Again, they've gone to looking at a dude that averaged 10 points at Tarleton State and was like 5'9. Like, They've contact. That's that's where they're at. If they miss on Padula like that, and a uh, guard from Dayton. Watch those two guys are going to be dropping thirty five points. Oh yeah, watch. And I, I will eat crow. <laughs> I'll come and say I am the worst. I suck. Whatever. I don't care. But come on, man. Like it just like I was excited. I will say this: like when they put together the team last year, and I saw they got Javon McCullough. I was hyped. Because I watched his film and I was like, and I, you and I talked about that. I was like, this dude can ball. He's going to put up some numbers. And he did until he got injured and it kind of slowed him down a little bit. Um, I was hyped about Hewley, right? Like he was really good at Pitt and again, got injured. The, the one player that we all thought was going to be really good this year and kind of, plateaued was milo shuzan right and that plateaued for its own reasons yeah totally agree and that one day we can discuss that publicly but right now we'll leave it at that but at the same time i'll sit here and tell you that houston's ecstatic to have that guy they think he is going to and exactly what i was told was everybody thought i can't remember the name i don't want to go through my text messages is that where you're going no they had a transfer that nobody thought was going to fit he wasn't tough enough or any of that and the dude came in and balled out and helped them make the final four um a few years ago and on that same note that's what they're hearing about use on and they use in and they think he's going to come in and just be that guy for him just be that third you know second or third option for him when they need a big bucket and they think he can play because they have such a good culture at Houston. And I think that's, that's the difference. Parker is Porter was all about, you remember the, the big wall that he had of everything about the culture that he had put up when he showed up to OU in their facilities and the offices and like that little trophy room, it's got all those words and it all like forms into, I think like an OU or something, but it's like their culture. And what they, all the words that they, they lean on to build their program and kind of be the base for everything. None of that's taken place because they have no stability on the roster. You cannot build culture without stability. And stability doesn't come without culture. You have both of them. They're equal parts. They do not take place. And there's been none of both under Porter Moser at the University of Oklahoma. None. I got nothing, man. Like, <laughs> I got nothing to add to that. Like, at this point, I, I don't know what's left to the discourse that hasn't already been said. Again, 
I will give Porter the benefit of the doubt heading into year four, regardless of what happens with Padula and with (laughs) Garrison. I will let him assemble his roster, whatever that looks like, and whatever happens, happens this winter. We reevaluate from there, and if things get better, okay, like maybe you're feeling good about this thing getting on track. If things get worse, then you might have a changing of the guard on your hands. But I think if that's the case, you know, things do get worse, then Oklahoma better hope that next year's coaching carousel has as many promising and viable options as this last coaching carousel did. Let me ask you this. And we talked about this off air. I think everybody wants Kellen Sampson to be the next guy. I think that is like the consensus across the board with Oklahoma fans, right? When regarding the basketball program, if, and when Porter Motors or ever moves on, they want it to be Kellen Sampson. Kelvin Sampson is not getting any younger. What happens? Because he's already been named coach in waiting, remember it, at Houston. But we all know that if Oklahoma comes calling, that would be the one program that he would look at and actually potentially leave Houston for, right? I I don't know if you leave Houston for Oklahoma if you're Kellen Zamson, because, boy, I mean, that – that speaks to a genuine undying. That's love. all he. That's, not, that, that, no, he does have undying love for that. No, I, well, I, and I, not, I, not just a love for the program, but like an almost sacrificial desire to watch that program in particular succeed. Because you were undertaking, like, let's just say again, for the sake of the, for sake of the hypothetical, things get worse under Porter in year four. There's a new uh, opportunity for a head coach to come in you're undertaking a massive rebuilding effort. Whereas whenever well, Kelvin Porter, Sampson decides that. to hang him up at Houston, yeah. you've you're got not. the machine already built. You just got to keep it running. But, but remember he grew up in Norman. Oh yeah. He went to Oklahoma. He coached at Oklahoma. The love is, I can 100, 1 million percent confirm that What's happening at Oklahoma bothers Kelvin, bothers Kellen, bothers Hollis, bothers Qantas. Now, their heart is definitely at Houston. They want to win a national title at Houston. That's where they're at. That's where they've been. They've got huge, huge love for Houston. But that time in Norman, particularly for Hollis, Qantas, and Kellen, was a substantial portion of their lives. And to watch a program that they helped build into a powerhouse, making the tournament, making deep runs, right? All the way through with Long Kruger, right? They were making runs to the Final Four, Sweet 16, Elite Eight. From like 1990, was 98 was the first time they made a Sweet 16 run to 2016. And to watch it just fade off, right? Because that 2020 year, they were going to make a run. They were hot. I mean, Austin Reeves was balling out, right? Like, that team was really good. And unfortunately, COVID happened and everything shut down. The retire of Lon Kruger, everything kind of, flipped on its head, right? So this has been hard for everybody. That's why I think he would listen. I would almost venture to say he would take the job. That's my guess. But at the same time, if Kelvin decides to retire, that that makes it to where I, I don't think if Kelvin retires, it would be, I think the job would be very, very hard to convince Kellen to leave then. If he left before Kellen or Kelvin retired, that makes it a lot easier, right? Because he's going and doing his own thing. He's building his own brand, and he's coaching at a place that he loves and wants to see be successful. If 
that doesn't happen, do you go get Hollis Price? You've got to go. I think you have to go grab one of those Houston guys. Just and I, I don't necessarily think it's because they're OU guys. I think it's because they win, Parker. That would be my way of doing things, but I'm not Joe C. I mean, it, I don't know who else who else you could go grab that would be just jumping for joy to be at Oklahoma right now. Yeah, well, with where things I, are at, and I, you know, I don't want to get... say that after Long Kruger because they got Porter Moser right. He was a top guy. Yeah, that's that's the difference in the program when he got here and where it is now. Yeah, well. Again, I don't want to get too deep in the rabbit hole of firing Porter before no, no, Porter's gone. But I'm but just saying what ifs. I think it <laughs> it would be to Porter's advantage and to this OU staff's advantage to just get Sean Padula and or Brandon Garrison because that at least is going to quell some of the noise because the season's been over donors. for darn near a month. Mm -hmm. No portal ads so far. None. Better call some donors because uh, the donors have been gracious on the NIL front with basketball because they did not want to go in the SEC and look like they don't belong. Well, <laughs> and plot now, twist. Plot twist. Yeah, exactly. Plot twist. You have all the money at your disposal, more money than you've ever had at your disposal with NIL. You and I can confirm that. They've never been able to, they've never had this type of money, have they? Since the NIL stuff started. And now he has more money than he's ever had. And they're whiffing, offering more money than everybody else. You might want to go grab another, some money and add on to what you've already offered and see if that doesn't entice somebody. Hmm. We'll see. All right. I think we've kind of ran that. So uh, that's going to do it for this version of the OU Insider Under the Visor Students podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed that banter. Some getting riled up a little bit. Um, if you're not an OU Insider member, Brody Lusk, our man has been just freaking killing it on the transfer portal. He's been a, he's been beating everybody to the punch. Oh yeah. As far as Killing like reporting. Him. And uh, I would venture to say that if you are into that type of stuff and you like transfer portal news on the football side, Parker and I will have that for you as well. You know, we didn't even talk about the new general manager hire. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Chuck Lilly. That's a good, good little Chuck hire. Lilly. We'll discuss all that on the next podcast. Great hire, by the way. Uh, everybody we've talked to as a general manager, uh, rave, rave reviews. So kind of funny Oklahoma is going in that route that we've discussed. Um, Curtis Lofton essentially is assistant general manager, right? Is that how that's going to work? Right now, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would, I would assume so. Yeah, we'll see how that works out. Um, because he was up for the collective general manager as well. So, but uh, they gave that to Lauren Chamberlain, who was qualified for that job. Um, and I just think you know Chuck Lilly was a great hire, according to most people we talked to. Uh, but anyways, if you want news like that if you want news on portal you want recruiting news you want team news OU insider vip 995 a month or 9995 we'll get you all the way to april 16th of 2025 if you sign up right now or 17th 18th 19th, 20 depending on when you want to sign up so give us a shot you want to try us for a whole month 995 We'll get you all the way to May, the middle of May. You'll get to go through the spring game, through a lot of portal stuff that's going to happen over the next month. You'll be ahead of the game. Uh, I guarantee you'll like it because there's thousands and thousands and thousands of OU fans on OU Insider VIP talking, debating, starting their own threads, talking to Parker and I. It's a fun time each and every day. Uh, our man Jesse Crittenton's covering uh, softball, uh, football. He does a great job with that, with basketball as well. Um, our man, Brian Clinton does a great on evaluations. If you want to know some of the guys and what coach Clinton thinks of everything, as far as recruits transfers, what they bring to the table, he does great evaluations, writes great stories for the team site. Obviously we got Brody lust and then you have Parker and myself doing the recruiting and team stuff as well. So, uh, bringing you the insider goods that, uh, you won't find anywhere else. Uh, so go to OU insider, give us a try. Also right here. 
YouTube channel. Oh, you insider YouTube channel, subscribe, hit that like, hit that bell, notified every time we put up a video, which is every day regarding OU baseball, basketball, softball, football, and recruiting. All right, for Parker Thune, my name is Brandon Drum. You guys have a blessed day.